Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's session, pioneering our understanding of the human brain. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. James Natt and Dr. Karen David. Dr. David and Dr. Natt have been principals in shaping the investigative functional neuroscience part of Brain Initiative from its inception in 2014. Both also hold responsibilities in systems, cognitive and computational neuroscience at NINDS, the Neurology Institute of NIH. Dr. David comes from a background in molecular biology and genetics and has served the Brain Initiative in various capacities, including as program analyst, project officer, scientific review officer, and her current role as program director. Dr. Nat enjoyed more than two decades of a research career in sensory motor, cognitive and quantitative systems neuroscience before going to NIH. In addition to a program director position with NINDS, he is a co-lead of the team of trans NIH program officers in the understanding circuits part of the Brain Initiative. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Nat and Dr. David will be presenting on NIH brain funding opportunities, NIH brain initiative and funding and functional human neuroscience. My name is Dr. Roshan Akashimun, and I will be your moderator for today's event. I am delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. We would like to extend our special thanks to the Brain Initiative Program Directors for their efforts in organizing today's session. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting questions during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions in the drop-down box. Our speakers will respond to your questions following their presentation. The presentation is educational and thus offers free continuing edu education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. And now, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. James Natt and Dr. Karen David. Dr. David. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Karen David, and along with my colleague, Jim Nutt, we represent the Brain Initiative. We'll be describing brain funding opportunities and understanding the circuit basis of behavior, with me focusing on those for non-human animal studies, and Jim Nutt will be focusing on those supporting functional human neuroscience. So what should we expect from this Lab Roots Neuroscience Symposium? For the first tract, in addition to an overview of the BRAIN initiative, we're excited to have our BRAIN-supported investigators showcase their work on functional human neuroscience. The second tract tackles the neuroethical considerations of human neuroscience research, as led by our colleague Saskia Hendricks and various experts in the field. And the third track to be introduced by our colleague Nick Langles will showcase innovative neurotechnologies in line with the goal of the Brain Initiative to accelerate the development and application of new technologies. And lastly, a better understanding of brain circuitry and networks has the potential to shed light on brain disorders. And so the fourth track will focus on clinical updates. And what should we expect for the first half of this 30-minute brain overview? I'll be providing an overview on what brain is all about, its vision, funding priorities, and budget. And then the bulk of this talk will be on the specific funding mechanisms supporting circus-related projects. And this part of the talk is geared towards investigators who are curious whether the Brain Initiative is a good fit for the project they have in mind. Then I'll close by describing ongoing activities with the Brain Initiative and provide you with more resources if you'd like to learn about the Brain Initiative. So what is the Brain Initiative about? Let's start with the very first sentence from the document, Brain 2025, a scientific vision written by Brain Working Group which is made up of representatives of the scientific community. The human brain is the source of our thoughts, emotions, perceptions, actions, and memories. It confers on us the abilities that make us human while simultaneously making each of us unique. 
Such a simple statement belies the challenge that comes with trying to understand how the brain works. How do the diverse set of cells, their synaptic connections, the neural circuitry, anatomical and functional, the dynamic patterns of activities, how do all these give rise to behavior? And towards this grand challenge of understanding how the brain works, the Brain Initiative aims to accelerate the development and use of tools for acquiring fundamental insight about how the nervous system functions. Hence its name, Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. And Brain has a particular focus on circuits and networks with goals to map the circuits of the brain, measure the fluctuating patterns of activity flowing within those circuits, and to understand how this interplay leads to cognitive and behavioral capabilities. So that the bold goals of BRAIN will be tractable, the BRAIN Working Group identified seven high-priority research areas that span multi-levels of analysis, touching on cell types, circuit diagrams, neural activities, interventional tools, computational tools, human brain research, and the integration of all these technological and conceptual approaches to understand the brain. And towards these high priority areas, 10 NIH institutes had worked together to design these diverse programs and initiatives to stimulate these areas of research. I'm noting here that on later slides, I'll be describing in detail the funding opportunities under integrated approaches. And all the programs offered here and the science we fund are made possible by continued public support. And we are very much grateful for the public support that enabled the ramping up of BRAIN's budget by almost 10 times from 2014 to today. The ramping up of funding that you see here has enabled us to expand the number and scope of programs to meet the various high priority areas. And this sustained long-term commitment is meant to attract talented researchers from multiple fields, as well as stimulate interdisciplinary collaborations, which will be key to advancing the goals of BRAIN. So this talk is part informational and part advertisement, as we hope to entice talented scientists out there to check out what BRAIN has to offer. And particularly, what we have to offer in terms of funding opportunities, and I'll be describing a set of initiatives focused on supporting projects with a goal of understanding the circuitry basis of behavior. In line with program priority number seven, our BRAIN team offers a suite of funding opportunity announcements, or FOAs, supporting research that integrates experimental, analytic, and theoretical capabilities for a comprehensive analysis of circuits and systems. We offer several funding mechanisms to support research at various stages, from exploratory to mature projects, and also at different scales from single projects from single labs or small teams to large multi-component programs led by big teams. And for more inf information, please contact us at this email, braincircuits at nih.gov. And please note that in some of these FOAs, foreign institutions and components are allowed. So let's start with the R34. The R34 mechanism is our entry level to our research project grants. And this funding opportunity is meant to support the exploratory efforts of individual or small multi-PI labs to enable them to apply for a future brain R01. And this is a two-year award meant to support a limited scope of aims and approach for establishing feasibility, validity, or other technically qualifying results to support a future BRAIN R1 project. And we've seen applicants use these mechanisms as an avenue to be creative and try out high-risk, high-reward approaches to improve how neuroscience questions are answered. But the R1 is meant for more extensive, elaborated goals with feasibility data. And we are interested in projects that are conceptually and technically innovative 
meaning projects that are tackling a basic high impact question in systems neuroscience using cutting edge approaches. Now, Brain 2025 states, no single researcher or discovery will solve the brain's mysteries. The most exciting approaches will bridge fields, linking experiment to theory, biology to engineering, tool development to experimental application, human neuroscience to non-human models, and more in innovative ways. And we've seen this come into fruition the best in our team research funding opportunities, where we encourage researchers with different expertise to come together to solve a neuroscience problem using an approach that is multidisciplinary and that which bridge, bridge scales. We also have two versions of our team science FOAs targeting different stages of the projects. The three-year U01 is intended for exploratory projects that seek to develop experimental capabilities and quantitative theoretical frameworks and to form teams in pre preparation for a future U19 application. The U19 is larger in scale and is multi-component, meaning that programs can come in with two to five projects and at most three resource cores and we do require two cores, the administrative and data science course. For studies that include basic experimental um, investigations with humans, only the U19 mechanism will accept such applications because we have a funding opportunity specific to that type of research, which Jim Knott will talk about. We also have a funding opportunity devo devoted to theories, models, and methods, which I won't be describing in detail here. Brain is also committed to promoting diversity and to training and supporting the new generation of transdisciplinary brain scientists. Towards this, we offer a K99 R00 program and supplements. Now, this is a colorful, busy slide which is meant to just illustrate the diverse topics and approaches that we're supporting. And this is important to note, especially when you're sending in an application. The expertise of the panel of reviewers will be diverse given the diverse set of topics that I just showed you. And this will be important to keep in mind when you're considering the audience of your application. And to potential applicants, it is also worth paying attention to the review criteria that is specific to the particular FOA that you're targeting. We encourage bold and adventurous projects, but this needs to be balanced with feasibility. And these applications are reviewed in special emphasis panels rather than standing study sections and we usually have just one to two receipt dates per year. And BRAIN has no defined pay line. So we make our funding decisions based on the following criteria. And also because of this, our funding deliberations take place at several levels. And as you can see here, it starts from the BRAIN teams, um, and the next level would be the coordinating team, followed by the multi-council working group, and then the 10 institute councils. And ultimately, the decision is made by the 10 institute directors. So that's all for our funding opportunities. And I would like to point out one last thing. As I've mentioned, BRAIN is nearing its second half. And so a working group is reviewing progress of the various programs towards the different scientific goals of the BRAIN initiative. And the goal would be to identify new opportunities for research and technology development. And the report is expected to come out this year. And for BRAIN enthusiasts, this would be something to watch out for. So that concludes this part of the talk. And to learn more about BRAIN, I highly recommend checking out our websites or emailing us for more information. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jim Knott. OK, thank you, Karen. Let us just do a transition here.
Okay. So let me start out by returning to um, this slide that Karen had presented earlier. And what I'm going to do is focus on this part of the uh, spectrum of, of funding opportunities that focus on human neuroscience and a little bit on our integrated approaches. So in the bottom left part of the slide there, we have two tracks for uh, our specific human neuroscience studies. One of them is a technology and device development track, and I'll describe that in a little bit more detail here in just a moment. And we also have what we, as Karen described, the research opportunities in humans, which is to understand functional neuroscience. Uh, in humans. And then uh, we, we do have also featured today, uh, later today, one program from our large U9 team, multi-component team uh, uh, brain circuits programs, our U19s, and uh, I'll get to that here in just a minute. Mm -hmm. So in terms of our human technology development funding announcements, uh, there is a portfolio of, of funding mechanisms that span the uh, track from doing concept clearance up to clinical trials, and as you see it here, early on in that process, there are uh, small programs, two-year R21 programs called uh, Brain New Concepts, and this is a funding mechanism to help support proof of, uh, proof of, proof of concept and proof of technology uh, early starts uh, in the development of new devices and new technologies. Following that, there is a five-year R01 mechanism um, called the uh, Brain New Technologies Program, and uh, that is a program to support novel discovery uh, on technology and devices for the study of the human brain. F following that, there is a program called the Brain Devices Optimization, which uses a cooperative agreement, a UO1 program, and the goal of that program is then to take uh, technologies that have been proven, have been um, um, successfully developed, and go through a process of very deliberative optimization of that. Um, and these are milestone-driven kinds of projects. Then following that, there are a spectrum of programs to make the final transition through the uh, IDE pro uh, uh, application program and up to clinical trials that you see there called the Brain Next Generation Devices and the Brain Next Generation uh, Devices. There's a, these, uh, a, an alphabet soup there of mechanisms, and I'll talk just briefly about those in the next slide, but um, I would guide you to the uh, NIH Brain website and also the contact there, Nick Langels, who you will actually hear from later today. Nick is one of the uh, leaders of the, this uh, human technology program for the Brain Initiative, so that's a good contact for you if you have questions about that. So um, then I will turn your attention to our research opportunities in humans mechanism. Um, th this is a program to support innovative in vivo human neuroscience research um, that is enabled by intracranial access, direct access to the brain for recording and stimulating. The idea of this project is not so much to support um, um, disorder or uh, uh, disease therapeutics. That is the domain of the NIH institutes. The goal here is to support model or hypothesis-driven uh, fundamental discovery in experimental neuroscience and human neuroscience. We use this program to support uh, multidisciplinary teams and multi-site recruitment uh, uh, in order to enable high-impact uh, uh, questions in human neuroscience. With the awardees from these, the, the ROH program, uh, we have formed a consortium work group um, with the idea of identifying uh, consensus standards of practice and neuroethical considerations. And in the next slide, I'll elaborate on that just a little bit. Um, the consortium, uh, in part, um, looks at at issues about how to collect and share data for ancillary studies using the data that are collected as valuable data that are collected from these human studies. Uh, they work on standardization for data and dissemination among the wider research community, and importantly work uh, on some neuroethical considerations. You'll hear more about that later today. Um, within this consortium, we have a subgroup called the Neuroethics Work, uh, work Group. 
And the unique aspect of these studies uh, that are supported by this program is we have investigative mechanistic research in patients that does not necessarily offer direct therapeutic benefits to the patient. So there are some uh, special neuroethical considerations for this. Um, these are projects that piggyback on to standard of care for, uh, for example, say epilepsy disorders. Um, but the, the research studies then are added on to those, and there are questions about how much additional risk is acceptable beyond the standard of care uh, that enables the access to the brain. There are also issues about informed consent uh, of these patients, patient altruism, and, rec and the possibilities for rec recruitment coercion, and we will have a group uh, actually addressing those issues later today. There are also issues about the, the conflicts of interest for the physician who serves as both the caretaker and the experimenter uh, for these investigative studies. So then just to finish up, uh, I return uh, to Karen's uh, portfolio of programs there, and I emphasize uh, down in the bottom right that we're going to talk about the, the uh, we have uh, invited guests to talk about their the research opportunities and humans awards and we have one of our large multi-component u19 uh, awardees that is doing uh, multi-species uh, studies that is both human and non-human primate studies and it will be one of the talks that are featured later today and in fact that is a talk by beth Be buffalo there at the top of this slide uh, on how the human brain learns to learn just to tie things up, um, the things that you will hear from our ROH awardees today, from our speech and language component of our awardees, we will have a talk by Mark Richardson, who will uh, talk about coding of speech production. We will have a talk provided by Mike Beauchamp, who um, is has an audiovisual speech, is part of an audiovisual speech project, but he also will actually be talking about some tool building efforts that he is also funded to do through the Brain Initiative. From our sensory and motor awards within the ROH space, we have uh, today uh, uh, talks by Nader Paradian and Ashley Feinsinger. Um, is particularly talking about some neuroethical implications um, under the auspices of this award about basal ganglia function. Uh, in humans. And finally, Jen uh, Collinger uh, will also be presenting later today, and Jen works on BMI issues in direct access to brain control. Um, from our executive and cognitive functions um, category of the ROH awardees, we will have a, a talk later today by Uli Rudishauer, who will talk about uh, human memory, and a talk from uh, Samir Sheth, who will talk about human prefrontal cortex. So just to finish things up, um, on behalf of Karen, myself, uh, Josh Gordon, and the rest of the NIH Brain team, uh, we are glad to have you all listening in today and um, hope that you are, are interested and challenged by the data that you're going to get from our uh, awardees later today. So I think that finishes up our, our presentation to introduce this. Thank you, Dr. Nat and Dr. David. That was very informative. We will now begin the question and answer portion of this presentation. As a reminder, please submit your questions by clicking on the Ask a Question box on the far left of your screen. We will address as many questions as time allots for. So let's begin with the first question. Um, Dr. Gordon stated that all data must be shared. What will that look like? Who will have access to what and how? So that's a complicated question with a complicated answer. So we are working very hard within the subdomains of the different aspects of the brain initiative to have reasoned and reasonable data sharing policies that will be useful for the research community, as well as do things like protect the intellectual property and the uh, personal information about patients. So our programs are designed um, not an all-in-one policy, but a, a policy that the data needs to be shared, is paid for by public funds, and we are creating multiple ways for that data um, to be shared in reasoned and reasonable ways. Uh, we do have a number of awards in, uh, in the area of data science that allow for 
uh, data archives, data analysis, and data definitions. So that is also part of the awards that we have in the NIH uh, Brain Initiative. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Is the brain device optimization inclusive to small businesses and startups? Yes, uh, I did go by that quickly, but there is a small business component um, to the um, uh, device development uh, part of our uh, human neuroscience. And in fact, there are public-private par partnerships that are enabled. There are partnerships with several uh, participating uh, device manufacturers that um, uh, uh, put in place creatives and other other useful things for uh, investigators to partner with those uh, uh, commercial entities and come up with new applications. So there is a small business portion to, to that program. Uh, are there any initiatives to connect with secondary education STEM teachers? Boy, that is an interesting question. Um, we don't, uh, that I know of, formally have a program for that. Uh, but that is certainly a challenge to us of an interesting question that would uh, be quite valuable. Thank you. Um, how does the transdisciplinary training work? The transdisciplinary training, I assume that is addressing the issues of uh, um, early career training. Um, so we have the K99R00 program that Karen had described before, and that's a transition program that is designed to take people in the later stages of their postdoctoral programs in a mentored situation um, to get a certain amount of progress made, and then that is transitioned into the what's called an R00 uh, award, which is a uh, research award that the candidate then uses in the transition to a first faculty position. Uh, in fact, it's a very valuable uh, negotiating tool for getting a new job, a uh, new faculty job. Um, we also support diversity programs uh, for training and in, in early career. We support diversity selection uh, among our uh, awardees uh, across the board in the Brain Initiative. All right, thank you. Um... How will efforts from the NIH Brain Initiative lead to better understanding of human diseases and disorders? Oh, well, yeah. So um, we specifically, for the most part, design the Brain Initiative to do what the institutes are not. So most of the funding for the specific diseases and disorders of the brain and the nervous system go through the various appropriate institutes. So the Brain Initiative focuses more on device and technology development and fundamental biology understanding of the brain uh, under the premise that until you understand a parts list and how those parts work, uh, that is a, a, a has to come first before we understand the most effective ways to address the remediation of diseases and disorders. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions for you. Is there, <laughs> is there provision to integrate postdocs coming from non-life sciences backgrounds? Um, absolutely. We encourage uh, uh, applicants and participants from outside of the neuroscience areas, especially with our emphasis on tool building. We are particularly interested in getting engineers, computer scientists, and physicists. Um, um, certainly, a, a, a physicist, for example, or an engineer is welcome to apply to one of the training programs or to one of our, our, our grant application mechanisms. We also encourage with our uh, team-based uh, awards that the teams that are, are, are put together are multidisciplinary, and so they would naturally bring in people from the, the quantitative sciences. Um, and, and psychology, behavioral and cognitive neuroscience. So um, that is absolutely encouraged within the Brain Initiative. What would you suggest to a bachelor student in order to be able to do research in this field in the future? What are the main things we should focus on besides neuroscience? For example, is programming with R Python an important skill to gain? Um, 
We believe very strongly that quantitative and computer science skills are an important part of what a biologist does. So the answer to the uh, question about learning computer languages is yes. You'll find that's a tool you'll use nearly every day. Um, um, so um, I mean, what was what was the first part of that question, Ro? Okay. Um, sorry. What would you recommend? What would you suggest to a bachelor's student in order to be able to do research in this field in the future? What are the main things we should focus on besides neuroscience? Right, so neuroscience is a an area of biology. So you can't know all of biology. You need to, to focus on where your interests are. Is it cellular neuroscience? Is it systems neuroscience? Is it cognitive neuroscience? But besides getting a focused uh, education in, in a narrow area, it's very important in neuroscience as a transdiscipline study of science is that you get a exposure to a broad array of approaches and techniques. Um, one of the fun things about neuroscience is that you never stop learning new things, new information, uh, and how to apply those to the important questions that we ask in neuroscience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. James Knapp and Dr. Karen David. We are out of time. If you have any other questions, please look to your email as our pre presenters will be able to respond to them by email later on. I would like to thank our wonderful audience today for all your incredible questions. And coming up next, please join us as we welcome the Brain Initiative awardees who will present on the scientific updates from the Research on Humans Division of the Brain Initiative. Hope to see you there. Thanks to all.